I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 3. And let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is your word and we are your people. And we thank you for bringing us together and giving us your word. We thank you, O Lord, for the gift of your Holy Spirit, which you have poured out on all believers. And Lord, we pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit that you would do what you have promised to do, that, that your spirit would come and be our teacher, that your spirit would help us to hear your word clearly, but also to receive it, to believe it, to live by it, to apply it in our lives. And Lord, we pray that you would use your word and your spirit now to do a thing, to change us, to transform us, to mold us in the shape of Christ. Lord, we pray that your spirit would work so powerfully now that we would not leave untouched and unchanged, but that we would be inspired and encouraged and stretched and loved because you have been with us in your word and in your spirit. So be glorified now through the reading of your word and the preaching of the word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our text for this morning is John chapter 3, and I'm reading the first 21 verses. Hear the word of God. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you of earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. 
For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Spirit of God is real. He is invisible, but very powerful. We can't see Him, but we can see what He does. And what He does is change us to make us different, to make us new. And this transformation that the Spirit accomplishes, this transformation is so extensive and so deep that it is like being born again. I call the Spirit, the Holy Spirit here, I refer to Him with a personal pronoun, He. That's the way the Bible talks of the Holy Spirit as a he, and not as an it. That's what I want you to see. The, the, he is part of the Trinity, the, the, the three in one, God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, all, all together in, in a mysterious way. And I'll unpack those relationships another time, but I, what you want, I want you to see is we have three in one, one God, three persons. The Holy Spirit is a person with intelligence and will and purpose and an ability to communicate personally. He is powerful, but not just power or energy or an impersonal force. The Father and the Son sent the Spirit to dwell within us. And when the Spirit dwells within us, we are changed. We are changed. Pentecost is a word for an ancient Jewish harvest festival. It was a, a first fruits festival, a, a first bringing in of the harvest. Uh, and that day, it was also called the Feast of Weeks. Um, because it was, its time was marked by an earlier festival. First came Passover, which was the celebration of God leading his people out of bondage in Egypt. And then came the festival of weeks, which was a week of weeks later. Seven sevens, 49 days. And then on the 50th day, the celebration of weeks began. 50th. Pentecost is just a word meaning 50th. 50th day, or Feast of Weeks. But people would come over, all over, just as they came out from all over at Passover, they would come from all over the world on Pentecost, and they would come to worship alongside the Jews, this, this time of celebration that God brings harvest. So people were coming, they were coming from all over, and they expected it to be like maybe other years when they had been in Jerusalem for this festival. But it's not like other years. Something very unexpected happens on this Pentecost. First, we're told that there is a, a loud noise. It is like a rushing wind, and not just a gentle breeze, but, but more like listening to a, a forceful gale or a or tornado. It is enough to get everyone's attention. And then there is something else. So, so people are, are, are stopping whatever they're doing, and they think, what, what is that wind? What is going on? And, and then they see it, it looks like some sort of a fiery thing up in the sky. And this, this fire uh, just starts coming down, and it's coming down and resting on certain people. And so now all the attention is on them, right? There's this noise and this, this, this 
fire, fingers of fire that are coming down and are resting on top of certain people. And so people start to dra draw near. What, what is going on? What's happening to these people? And then as, as we draw close, we hear that they are talking about Jesus. And they're talking about God sending Jesus and how He died and how He rose again. And the amazing thing is that they are saying these words in all different languages. So here's a person, and he's traveled, say, from Egypt, and he's coming into the Promised Land, and uh, he's coming into Jerusalem, and uh, he maybe has been there many, many years, and he speaks what they speak in Egypt. He doesn't speak Aramaic. He doesn't speak Hebrew. But he kind of knows what's going on, and he can join in with the worship and is glad to be there. But he comes into Egypt. He's made this long journey. He comes into, into Jerusalem. He hears this noise. He sees these flames, and he comes down on a person not too far from him. And he hears this person speaking of Jesus, but he's speaking Egyptian. And he's saying, I know this is a local guy, what is going on? And Peter gets up to explain. Long before Jesus came, God spoke through the prophet Joel and said this day would come and he would pour out his spirit upon all people, all believers, all his people. And then Jesus, when he did come, before he died, he promised, he said, I'm going to I'm going to die, and I will be raised on the third day. I'm going to go away from you, but there is a way in which it is good that I go, because when I go, I will send the Holy Spirit upon you, the Helper. And then after Jesus was raised, he appeared again to his followers, and he said, stay in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes and you are filled with his power. And so God has actually fulfilled all of these promises in an amazing way on the day of Pentecost. It actually happened. It changed history. The question is, can it change us? And if so, how? And I want to look at that question and seek to answer it by looking at this encounter that Jesus has with Nicodemus. Just, just two characters on the scene, just, knees, just Jesus and Nicodemus, this, this Jewish leader. But I think we're going to see here through that conversation, through what Jesus says to Nicodemus, we will see that we must be changed. And we will see that the Holy Spirit changes us and that he does so as we believe in Jesus. We must be changed. The Spirit changes us as we believe in Christ. We must be changed. We must be changed if we are going to be rescued from this world, which Jesus said is a, is a world that is perishing. It is a world that stands under condemnation because it has rejected God and the one that God has sent. If we are to be rescued from this world and to be part of God's eternal kingdom, then we must be changed. We must be changed. Now, Nicodemus is a deeply religious man. He is an esteemed leader. He is moral and upright in his character. He is respected in so many ways as, as a godly teacher. But he comes now and he calls Jesus teacher. He, he acknowledges that Jesus is a teacher. And he is willing and eager to learn from him. How shocked he must have been to hear Jesus say, you must be born again. You must be born again. Nicodemus, you need a total overhaul. And we listen into the conversation and we think, if that's true of Nicodemus, is it true for us too? Do we need to be changed? What about us? You know, for the most part, 
I think people, human beings in general, t tend to think well, we're, we're okay. We're not perfect, but we're, we're okay. We're good enough. If, if there is a God, He knows that uh, oh, I'm doing my best. And I, I mess up from time to time, but uh, I, think we're, I think we're good. I think we're good. But God is not looking for just small adjustments, a little church going, a little reformed behavior, a little more Bible knowledge, a little adjustment in our priorities and lifestyles. No, He is looking for us to be made new over again, born again. We must be changed. We must be transformed from unbelievers into believers, from, from those who are just following our own desires to those who follow Jesus. We must be changed. And Jesus teaches that the Holy Spirit is able to do this very thing. The Holy Spirit is able to change us. That might be hard for us to believe, and I, I'm going to come back to that, why I think it's hard for us to believe, but it is true. The Bible teaches us, God reveals to us, that the Spirit is powerful and is able to change us. I want to just give you a smattering of the ways that He's able to change us. We, we could see it throughout Scripture, but we see, for example, that the Holy Spirit is able to convict us of sin, to get through that feeling, oh, I, th I think I'm pretty good. No, the Holy Spirit is able to say, Maybe you're not so good as you think you are. John 16, and Jesus said, And when He, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, comes, He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Also in that John 16, He says that the Spirit will come and He will teach us. The Spirit teaches us so that we can understand and apply God's truth. When the Spirit of God comes, He will guide you into all the truth, Jesus says. And the Spirit can, can build new qualities and new, new character into our lives. Either, either take what is there and, and, and help it to grow or put it there in the first place. And some of these characteristics are things that we long for. And the Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. The Spirit is able to reassure us that we belong to God. When we have those moments, does God really love me? Does God really hear me? Does, has God really forgiven me? Well, God has given us the Spirit. Romans 8, the Spirit bears witness. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Just that, you know, the devil is always there saying, no, you're not. No, you're not. And the Spirit is living in us say, oh, yes, you are. The Spirit helps us pray. Romans 8, the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. The Spirit helps us tell other people about Jesus, which is hard for us. But, but God says, Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. The Holy Spirit is able to do all of these things. And He's not only able to do such things, He is the only one who can do that which must be done. And that is to make us new, to transform us so that we are alive spiritually. Well, what do I, what do I mean by that? What, what do I mean by being alive spiritually? Jesus says, that which is flesh, born of the flesh, is flesh. Uh, that which has a physical origin has physical life. We are physically alive, and that's good. Now, 
the life that we have is sometimes hard, but it is good and enjoyable in many ways. Just, just think of our senses. We are able to see beautiful, wonderful colors and, and, and grand landscapes. We are able to hear music and the conversation of a loved one and the songs of birds. We can feel textures and, and make things with our hands. We can, we can smell spices and flowers and good food. And we could taste that good food. The sweet and the bitter and the salty and the spicy. That which is born of the flesh can do all these things. But you know what it can't do? It can't see God. It can't know God. It can't grow close to God. That requires a new sense, a new capacity, a new life, a spirit-born life, a spiritual life. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit, is spiritually alive. And Jesus says, that must happen. And the Spirit can make that happen in you and in me. Jesus says to this res respected, revered, educated, powerful Jewish leader, you must be born again. And unless one is born again, he can't even see the kingdom of God. There's, there's no capacity for it. You can't see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. And he says, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Jesus now, when he repeats this and reiterates it, he brings better water and spirit. And I think he knows exactly what he's doing. Nicodemus knows his Bible better than I do and better than most of us, I venture. And I, I'm sure that Jesus thinks Nicodemus is going to think on a very important Old Testament passage from Ezekiel chapter 36, where God promises through Ezekiel, God promises, God says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues and be careful to obey my rules. God places his spirit within us. And the Spirit can transform us completely so that we have a new spirit and a new heart and a new character and a new sense of belonging and we are made new. How can that be? How can that be? That's what Nicodemus says. What? What are you talking about? How can an old man be born again? Can, can, can he enter his mother's womb a second time? That's just absurd. You're, you're saying words, but I don't know what they mean. That's what Nicodemus wants to know how, and that's what we want to know how. And what Jesus is doing here in this encounter with Nicodemus, Jesus is preaching the gospel. And Jesus is saying, first, God must do something. God must send his son, and his son must die and be raised again. Jesus says, no one is ascended into heaven. I know you want to go there, Nicodemus. No one is ascended into heaven except the one who came from there, the Son of Man. That's Jesus. And the Son of Man must be lifted up. He must be lifted up 
on the cross to make atonement for our sins. Jesus had to be lifted up on the cross to die in our place to pay the penalty for our sins. So God must do that thing. And then the Spirit must open our eyes to see the truth and our ears to hear and to receive this testimony, this announcement, this news. And that's faith. That's belief. We must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and in what He has done, putting our trust in Jesus and His cross and His resurrection, believing that His death has made us clean, that His rising from the grave has given us everlasting life. Do we believe it? Do we believe this? Do we believe that Jesus is able to make us new? Do we believe that we are forgiven and loved and adopted because we follow Jesus? Do we believe that He is able to change us and to put our sins more and more behind us so that we might become more and more like Jesus and experience His love and His joy and His peace? Do we believe that He will do that for us? Do we believe that He does that for others? We may hear the good news of Jesus many times over. I think most of us hear this, this good news probably several times before it sinks in. But there's something that happens. At some moment, it does grip us, and we start to hope. Can that be true for me? Can my sins be washed away? Can I know God? Can I know His joy and His peace and His patience? in my own life? Can, can I live with Him forever? And when we start to think these things, that's the Holy Spirit at work within us and calling to us. Look to Jesus. Believe in Jesus. And Jesus said to Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. Now, you may not remember that passage. I'm sure Nicodemus did from Numbers 21. When God led the people out of bondage in Egypt and they are wandering now in, in the desert and, and, you know, the desert isn't where they want to be and things aren't quite as they expect and they're grumbling against God. God, this isn't the way we think things ought to be. They, they grumble. They start to rebel against God. God sends snakes and they bite people, and people start dying. And God tells Moses, he says, I want you to, to make a serpent, a snake out of bronze, and lift it up onto a pole. And tell the people, look at the serpent, and they will be healed. And the people are saying, how can that be, right? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to... Can, find some herbs that will work as an anti venom or draw the poison out, or run away as fast as I can. And you mean to tell me all I have to do is look up there and look at the snake that is lifted up? Well, the people that did that were healed. The people that did that were healed. And Jesus said, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. And you must look. You must look to Jesus. You must trust in Jesus, and He will make you new. For all of us who are Christ followers, Jesus, the Spirit has done that. Uh, we, we sing in the old hymn, Amazing Grace. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Do you remember that hour? For some of us, that was an hour or two ago, right? That may have been a long time ago. We might have forgotten what that felt like when we first knew that we were forgiven, that God loved us with a redeeming love. It may be so far away that we've forgotten it and it's lost some of its shine for us. And we start to think maybe it's just all in the past. 
That's why I say that faith is harder than we sometimes think. Faith is challenging and stretching for us. We may be led to think, you know, I, I did believe, and, I, and I, I, I think that God has made me his own, but, but I don't know that anything else is happening. I think my life is pretty much the way it's going to be. Um, maybe I'm better than I used to be, but I'm probably just about as good as I'm going to get. But the Spirit keeps working. The Spirit keeps working and helping us to grow to be like Jesus. And I think the other thing that is hard for us to believe, I think it's hard for us sometimes to believe that He can actually change other people too. That the Spirit can actually change my neighbor. That the Spirit can actually change my coworker who seems so anti God that the Spirit can actually change and, and transformingly love my friends and my loved ones who are not walking with Him. I think we struggle to believe that. And that is why I am so excited by what God has done for us at Pentecost to remind us again that He comes to us not with a message only, but with power to change, with power to make us new. And I think we need to be reminded of that, brothers and sisters, because I think sometimes we feel like dry bones, weary and worn out and skeptical and disillusioned. God came and spoke to His people through the prophet Ezekiel, and He said, I will make you clean. I will wash you clean. I will put My Spirit within you. And then, after He said this to the people through Ezekiel, He gave Ezekiel an illustration, a vision. And he led Ezekiel in his vision to this valley, and it was full of dry bones. And he said to Ezekiel, essentially, okay, Ezekiel, you've just heard of the power of my spirit. Do you believe it? Look at this valley of dry bones. And God says to Ezekiel, can these bones live? And then God says to the bones... I will cause my breath to enter into you, and you will live. And there is a rattling in the valley, and the toe bone was connected to the foot bone, and you know the rest. And God made these valley of dry bones rise into a living, spirit-filled, God-breathed army that stood before him. And God says to Ezekiel, the people say our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. But I will put my spirit within you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it, declares the Lord. Let us pray.